last week we praised and worshiped without kids and I have to say I missed them because you know they bring another level of energy so I think you need to bring the energy tonight okay yeah it's not because we're trying to work something up but it is because we love Jesus and you know if we can go to a concert and scream or to a football game and scream or to something like that and be all excited and and scream and yell and shout then we can do double that for Jesus amen, amen. hallelujah so in this house we worship with freedom we worship with liberty and that's what we do so welcome you're welcome to join us on however whatever that looks like to you amen, amen. and we also know because of the word of God when we praise we silence the enemy yes. how many of you know that there needs to be an enemy that is silenced in the world right now and so even as we praise the enemy is being silenced even as we focus on Jesus and we meet with him face to face and we give him our highest praise all that the enemy is doing is silenced amen in fact, that's a really good thing to remember. If there are things going on in your head, go ahead and praise. And it silences the enemy. And when we praise and we worship, it also confuses the enemy. And in the story of Jehoshaphat, the enemy actually turned on himself and completely wiped himself out. So our praise and our worship is a weapon of warfare. Our praise and our worship is executing judgment on the enemy tonight so even as we focus on him things like the enemy behind COVID-19 are under our feet and the enemy behind fear are under our feet and the enemy behind all sorts of things that keep trying to consume us in the world today are under our feet so I just invite you if there's something consuming your mind right now just put it down there already. Just lay it down there and focus your eyes on Jesus. Focus your mind on his goodness, his faithfulness, his mercy. Just go ahead and say, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You are good. You are faithful. You are just. We love you. We adore you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Let's just go ahead and sing. We're going to speak to some dry bones tonight. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. He's the God of the breakthrough.
Is more than 
Yeah. 
just worship you tonight. Oh, you are above everything that has walked with us in the door. We just lay it at your feet even now so we can focus on you, Jesus. You face to face tonight. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just raise your hands in the presence of the Lord here tonight. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that we can come together and we can worship him? Hallelujah. We thank you for the word of the Lord, which is life and is true. And we can speak that word and the power of life and death is in the tongue. And we speak life. I speak life right now over every situation, every circumstance that doesn't look the, the way that, that we might have hoped, the way we might have dreamed. I, I, I speak life over every prodigal that is listed on these trees. Every prayer request, no matter how big, no matter how, how, how small, we speak life to those things in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. You can give the Lord a praise. Give the Lord a praise. Nate, why don't you bring that up here? Hallelujah. You going to read it, brother? All right, he's going to read it. Come on. I just want to give God some glory real fast first. I got out of prison a year ago. And God has restored everything in my life, but the major thing that God restored was my heart and the love that, I, that he restored and I never felt love. Nothing but Jesus. Like this is the verse when I have struggled through this year that I always go back to is 2 Corinthians 4 8. We have troubles all around us, but we are not defeated. We, we often don't know what to do, but we do not give up. We are persecuted, but God does not leave us. We are hurt sometimes, but we are not destroyed. Nothing but Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a word for somebody here tonight. In fact, I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that, that, that there, there's so many words going around. There's so, many, there's so much talk going around. The Lord, the, the, you all, we all know and understand, you can turn on the news. You can, you, can, you can go to social media, and there's thoughts, and there's words, and there's opinions, and everything flying around. And the Lord says, surely I am pouring out my word in this season over you. The Lord says, I am pouring out everything that you need. Though you maybe feel like you're pulled this direction and that direction, and everything is chaotic around you. The Lord says, I have released a word of grace over your life, a, gr a word of peace over your life. The Lord says, I am pouring out my word on you, which, which contains everything that you need in this time and this season. So the Lord says, don't look to the things of the world, but look up to me. For the Lord says, surely I am pouring out in abundance in this season. I am pouring out abundance in this season. The Lord says, I, I see I see in my spirit, the Lord is pouring out and pouring out. See, as, as, as much as the world is trying to pour out, the God is pouring out even more. But what, he, what, what we need to do is we need to be looking for it. We need to be positioning ourselves for it. We need to have our eyes on that. Because if our eyes are on the thing, everything that social media is saying, then our eyes are off of what God is saying. And the Lord says, surely I am, I, he's not holding anything back in this season, but he's pouring out abundantly. There is strategy, heavenly strategy that is being poured out now for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. There is healing. There's, there's deep healing healing that is being even poured out in this day and in this hour. Hallelujah. If you're in need of healing right now, I just want you to raise, I don't care what it is, raise your hand and, and, and just wave. And if you see somebody that's waving, I want you to put hand, lay hands on them. So so it's, um, we have a, a few back here. Make sure somebody gets um, Stephanie, but but lay hands on them. Right here, lay hands on this brother here. Whoever needs healing, and, and right now, in Jesus, and, and, and by the way, I know Renee is, is watching online, and she's uh, she's dealing with e uh, ear issues and headaches and things like that. And so, you know, I don't know, uh, in, in proxy, her daughter can lay hands on her. Or her, she's on the floor. All right, all right. So you just stay in the glory right there, Ashley. But hallelujah. But, but we just speak, we speak life right now to every ailment. No matter how big, no matter how small, we speak life to, to every pain in the body. We say it must go right now in Jesus' name. And I declare the pain isn't just going, but it's being replaced by the very breath of God. The very breath of God is being replaced right now in Jesus' name. So pain, go. Everyone say go. In Jesus' name. Sickness, everyone say go. In Jesus' name. Infirmity, everyone say go. In Jesus' name, I need the injury. I say go. 
in Jesus name whatever it is we just declare life over that situation and we'll release now the healing anointing of God over each and every one everyone that's being laid hands on we release the healing anointing and for those who are laying the hands on well Lord I just pray that you give them you just give them a little dose of what what they're releasing right now I pray, I pray father God that they they feel your power your touch that they that they even walk away say I didn't think I needed healing but I feel so much better hallelujah hallelujah praise the Lord I'm just gonna I just saw the Lord do this earlier today and so I'm gonna continue I want everybody to lay hands on your head lay hands on your own head because that's better for social distancing hallelujah Father God, I just pray that anything that is out of alignment in each and every head will come into alignment and be healed right now. Everything that is uh, physical and everything that is spiritual and everything that is mental, right now we command each and every hormone to get into kingdom alignment. We say brains will function appropriately. We say all things related to the brain will come into kingdom alignment and kingdom order right now in Jesus' name. Place your hand on your face. I command eyes to get into kingdom alignment and kingdom order. I say be healed eyes spiritually and physically right now. I command all the senses to come into kingdom alignment and kingdom order right now. How many of you know that the senses are one of the attacks of the enemy with COVID? We say no in the name of Jesus. We say that there will be healing to smell and there will be healing to taste right now in Jesus' name. We say that anything that is triggered by these things emotionally and physically would end tonight in Jesus' name. I release healing to all five senses right now in the name of Jesus. I say hearing would be healed spiritually and physically tonight in Jesus' name. Lay your hands on your ears. Receive healing for your ears right now. Lay hands on your necks. I say the neck and spine will come into complete and total kingdom alignment right now. And every nerve attached would be aligned now. Every shoreke sahesha, every vertebrae, every disc, line up now in the name of Jesus. And for Phil, if you're watching online, I say that disc would release the nerve now in the name of Jesus. Release the nerve, disc. You are need to get off that nerve right now and that nerve needs to be released. And now I release healing right now in the name of Jesus. Healing to all of those nerves, everything that's causing pain right now. Put your hand on your stomach. Every stomach issue, I say no more tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you that stomachs are being healed. Acid reflux is being healed. Even uh, physical and emotional stomach things. Butterflies in the stomach. Fear that comes in the stomach. We cancel its assignment now. Place your hand on your heart. I say hearts are being healed tonight, physically and emotionally and spiritually. I say Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Broken hearts are being healed tonight in Jesus' name. Shoulders, limbs, fingers, toes, knees, anything that's associated with these things. Place your hand on it now. Hallelujah. I say that all bones are healed right now. All muscles are healed. All tendons, all ligaments healed right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you that arches are being healed right now in Jesus' name. I thank you that shoulders are being healed right now in Jesus' name. I thank you. I feel the fire right now. Who feels a fire? If you feel the fire, God's doing a healing work right now. He's probably, even if you don't feel the fire. There's fire in my belly. There's fire in my nerves. There's fire. God is healing you tonight. Just take a hold of it. Hallelujah. Anything else, God? All of the reproductive system, any, any healing, don't put your hands on that. Any healing you need in that, we release it now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Laughter is good medicine. We laugh and that heals us too, amen. Hallelujah. I release healing to us. Immune systems. Anything that has to do with immune systems, we release healing to it now. Immune deficiencies and, and the, uh, so the, like lupus and those kind of diseases, we release healing to them now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, I think we covered it. We should be good and healed tonight. Amen. Just give him some praise. 
As we were singing the last song, singing Breakthrough, I all of a sudden I felt this pain in my chest, and I was like, Lord, what is going on? Who's actually restricting me from getting breath to sing the song, right? And I was like, what's going on? And the Lord actually showed me there's a spirit, there's a word of knowledge, there's a spirit restricting the breath, restricting the life from coming into you. And so I just, what I want you to do is, a, and, and some of you may see this in the spirit, some of you may not, but you're going to do this sort of physical gesture. It's kind of a, an act of faith or a prophetic act is what we like to call it. I want you to grab the spirit that's right here, and I want you to rip them off in the name of Jesus. And we just prof prophesy the breath of God and we command that spirit to be thrown into where Jesus would send you. We just declare the breath of God again to flow into their bodies over every part, over every new, every system of the body in the name of Jesus that Pastor Sarah just highlighted. We just prophesy the breath of God, the breath of God. And the Lord says, where you have sought for breakthrough and it has felt like you have not been able to get to the other side. You have not not been able to break out of the restriction the Lord says I am breaking you out of the restrictions I am breaking you out of the restrictions the Lord says I am bringing the freedom to you that you've never had before and the Lord says where you have felt I can't do this and I can't do that and it's really hard and this is really hard the Lord says he's actually making a path of freedom in which others will follow you into freedom the Lord says breathe deeply of my glory I literally can see as we were worshiping, I could see the breath of God. You know how like in the cold air, you breathe out, you can see a breath? I could see the breath of God just hovering in the room. So I want you to breathe in deeply of the breath of God. Lord, we thank you for your ruach. We thank you for your glory. God, we ask you to show us your glory again. God, show us your ruach tonight. Show us your glory. Lord, you told us to prophesy to the breath breath the four winds of heaven itself declare life over every part that has been slain in the name of Jesus we're gonna sing we're gonna worship hallelujah we
just bow to Jesus tonight. for your presence. We thank you for your power, your dunamis power, your power that is greater than any other power. How many people are thankful for the power of God? Oh, we thank you for the power that heals. We thank you for the power that delivers. Hallelujah. He's here to deliver. The fear has to go. I know the fear goes sometimes on Saturday and it comes back by Sunday. I command the fear to go. It needs to go. It needs to go tonight. The fear in the night season that's bringing the nightmares. We say no more in Jesus' name. It is under your feet. There is no more fear. I command the panic to go now in Jesus' name. The anxiety needs to go now in Jesus' name. The PTSD needs to go now in Jesus' name. It cannot stay. It is trespassing and it needs to go. I say go now in the name of Jesus. Who is in agreement with me? On the count of three, I want you to tell it to go. If you need it to go and you, it's going. If you need it to go, otherwise you can be in agreement with somebody else. One, two, three, go! Hallelujah. You know what? I hear the Lord saying we need to tell it to go again. Every single person. This is not the time to observe this is the time to engage because this is your night to get free if you're standing back and you're observing you're going to miss out I'm just going to be real with you because God is saying tell it to go we're going to tell it to go one two three go it has invaded our atmosphere for too long. So I release the power of God to the atmosphere tonight to, to change the atmosphere from fear to faith, from fear to joy, from fear to peace. I release the shalom tonight in the name of Jesus. Shalom to each person. Oh, a tangible shalom. A tangible shalom. Come down now. The glory of God is here for tangible Shalom. What does that mean? Tangible shalom is peace, but it's not just peace. It's the way things ought to be. The perfect way of God. Whether that is everything in perfect kingdom alignment and kingdom order. And tangible means that you feel it. That you know it. That there's no doubt. Huh, oh yeah, there it is. Doubt, you are trespassing and you need to go. Because there is no doubt. So, we're going to tell the doubt to go so we can feel the tangible shalom. Are you ready? One, two, three, doubt. Go! 
I don't know, every one of you better set it because otherwise he's going to make me do it again. We better do it again. One, two, three. Go! Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, tangible shalom. Tangible shalom. Tangible shalom. Tangible shalom. Tangible shalom. Tangible shalom. The fire of God is coming. It's invading. There's a fire wave right now. It's coming in. I see it. It's coming from the side. The fire is coming. Do you feel the fire? If you feel the fire, I want you to jump up and down and say, thank you, Jesus. Feel the fire. The fire of God is here. The fire of God is here. It's fire glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, as those things go, God has something better. And his word says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We enter into his courts with praise. You know, We've been entering into, the, the, the world wants us to enter into all kinds of craziness. That's where the fear and the doubt and all that sort of thing comes in. But we don't operate in fear and doubt in this house. And you've told it to go. So right now, I just want to ask you a simple question. Are you thankful? Are you thankful for what he's done in your life? What he's doing in your life and what he's going to do in your life? Hallelujah. And, 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 and can we just praise him? I know we've been spending a whole lot of time praising him. Let's just give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. When you do that from your heart, that position, positions you into his courts. And his courts is the place of glory because it's the place of his presence. I want the rest of this service. We're already there, but I just want you to see this and grab hold of this. To be in a, seated in a place in his courts, all right? Meaning in, in a place of his presence, a place where he's enthroned, where all the stuff of the world really doesn't matter. In the, in the presence of God, in the courtroom, in the, in the throne room of God, <laughs> in the, with the very maker of the heavens and the earth, who defeated death, hell, and the grave. Does the things going on around us really seem like that big of a deal? Hallelujah. So, Lord, let your glory flow in this place. Lord, we want to be seated in your throne room, seated in your courts, and, and, and surrounded by your presence and your glory here tonight. Can everybody say amen? Amen. Do me a favor. Turn around. Greet two or three people. Uh, give, give them a high five if that's all right. Um, Way to get so it, it, it's it's live now. No, it's not. We're recording. Okay, let's see. Did this did this thing end? Okay, here we go. This is what I got to do. Just talk amongst yourselves. I got to train Andrew on how to how to fix these sort of things. It wasn't supposed to end, but live. Okay, we're going and go live now. Um, oh. It, it's li what? You, you, you switch the stream? Are you sneaky. Are you sure it's live? Oh, but did you, did you do the R? <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's, uh, okay, yeah. You're right, right. I, I got to click the button over here, though. It's these two things together, working together, that make it happen. There we go. I think, it's, I think it'll go on now. <sighs> and this is why you pray for your pastors right here. I, I heard some phones going off, I think. I think maybe it worked. All right. Oh, man. Wasn't that just amazing, Andrew, what just happened? 
Oh, this presence. I mean, it was the most phenomenal thing that has ever happened here at High Pre Oh, you mean we weren't live? Oh, darn. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, uh, where were we? Tithes and offerings. Okay, um, so anyways, uh, and, and our friends online. That's where I was. How perfect is that? Can always give any time at www.highpraisecentralmn.com. Okay. Uh, let's just pray. Let's just pray. Let's take your gifts in your hand. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for each gift. I thank you for each giver. I thank you for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that as we sow with cheerful, hilarious hearts, I thank you that uh, there's promises attached to our giving, that your word says that you'll give back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, that you'll rebuke the devour on our behalf. So, Lord, we give this up to you you as an offering uh, with with uh, uh, with just with just joy in our hearts because you gave everything for us it's the least that we can do to to uh, give cheerfully and hilariously here tonight in Jesus name and everybody said amen. Amen. amen all right thank you guys so much for your faithful giving a few quick announcements here um, our our next um, uh, high praise leadership and mentoring discipleship is, is next Saturday uh, August 5th is the wrong date um, and Kim pointed that out to me a long time ago. I still didn't fix it on here. But next, <laughs> next, Saturday, next Saturday will be our next one here. And uh, for those of you who are a part of that, uh, we talked about this last week, but I want you to come with, uh, prepared with some questions. We'll just kind of do some back and forth uh, Q&A sort of thing. Um, so be thinking about that in the coming week. Um, and then um, just a, a reminder, too, that uh, starting this fall, Monday evening, 6.30 p.m., we'll be doing our High Praise Revival Academy. Um, so that is uh, starting September 21st, Monday nights, and we'll kind of go um, through, the, through the winter and just kind of see what God wants to do. Again, uh, I just, I just want to get this out here now so people can plan and know what's going on. But um, the whole idea behind this is that we'll be talking a lot, obviously, about revival. Um, but not, not just, uh, well, we're talking about like uh, re revivals, recent revivals like Azusa, things like that. Also biblical revivals um, and what, what revival really means. But it's also going to be a, a training session uh, in, and I really want to focus on team training, working together as teams. Um, because I think that's a key component to seeing revival. And as I've said even before, uh, we're calling it Revival Academy because it was a catchy uh, name. Um, it, there's not a tuition or anything like that. Uh, so it's just Monday nights starting at 6.30 p.m. On, on the 21st of September. Anybody is welcome. All right. Anything else I need to an uh, announce, Sarah? Nope. All right. And we are live and we're good and it's all working. Praise the Lord. All right. Kind of the ch <laughs> okay, well, that sounds interesting. Didn't cross the bottom. The graphic? Andrew, can you can help with that too? No? Okay. Oh, it's got both of us? All right, well, that's fine. Because, you know, hey, why don't you come up here and wave then? And then it'll be accurate. There you go. There we go. Now the bottom part is accurate. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, I, <laughs> oh, you guys ready for some word here tonight? All right. Uh, so I want to you know, start out by asking you a question here, uh, especially for those of you who've been around, been, been here the past few weeks. How, how's it going? What has been consuming you? What's been consuming you? We talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago and kind of followed up on it last week. But um, if we're honest with ourselves, I know, um, you know, just speaking from personal experience, if you were here for that word, you know, the whole idea behind it was, you know, that God is an all-consuming fire. And yet there's a lot of things in the world that want to get us, that consume us, things that aren't from God. All you have to do, again, is turn on the news or social media. And I don't care what your, what your opinion is on whatever the issue is. People are consumed by things right now. And we talked about how we need to not be consumed by things of the world, but be consumed by the all-consuming fire. But that's uh, easier said than done, isn't it? Isn't it? So, so I just, I just want to ask you, is a, is a rhetorical question, is a challenge for you, especially if you were here for the message. If you weren't, you can go back online and watch it. But if, if you're here for it, what is consuming you? Maybe it's a question that you need to ask yourself every day, every morning, when you get up every night, you know, before you go to bed at night. What's been consuming me today? And remind yourself to get into the all-consuming fire and not get, get caught in, in the things of the world. Amen? So... 
in the past, I don't know, couple months, we've been talking uh, about a, a variety of things. We, we talked um, a couple months ago, we were talking about, remember, the season of forming, how we're in a season of forming, uh, and, but we're, which is a transition season. We're transitioning from a season of farming into a season of fighting. And we talked about how uh, the, the Bible verses that talk about beating your plowshares into swords or beating your short, swords into plowshares. And we're in that, in that season of transforming from one to the other. It, that I, I believe that God is doing a work in us. And when God puts you into a season of forming, he gives you everything that you need for the season that you're heading into. And, and, uh, and so we talked about that. And I believe that that's what's happening right now. That's what we've been... It, you know, the, everything since then uh, and before then has been uh, part of that forming and preparing us. We talked about being salt and light. What that truly means, how we are actually salt and light. Uh, and then we talked about what I mentioned before, the all-consuming fire. Being consumed by the things of God, uh, not the things of the world. But also then how once we, once we step into that all-consuming fire, that fire is in our mouth. And we can speak words we can speak when the when the when the word is in our heart his breath is in our lungs and then his fire is on our mouth and we can speak words even if it's just simple that still small voice that can that can just cut through all the garbage of the world to somebody and and it's that sort of thing that sticks with them that begins to consume them and 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 it, we looked at jeremiah and how his, it's an example of you know well i don't want to get ahead of myself but it's it's an example of this that's what we talked about last week see and I think all of this is, is setting up and, and been, it, it may seem like the, some of these things are disconnected, but they're not. That God has been can, bringing us along on this journey. And, and tonight is kind of just the next step in that journey. Uh, in fact, we're going to go on a very interesting biblical journey here tonight. You, you and me together, all right? So I want you to buckle in. I, and I believe God is setting some stuff up. All that stuff that I just talked about, he was setting some things up. And tonight is, is a setup for, for, uh, for, for some, some big things. But this is going to be a really interesting journey. It was an interesting journey that God took me on, a scriptural journey. Um, and, and so I want you to stick with me on this uh, because I, I think it's going to be really cool. But, uh, but uh, I, I've never heard anybody talk about this quite this way, so... You know, I, I, I believe it's a now word from God. Amen? Amen? So, Father God, I just thank you for this night. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word does not return void, but it will accomplish everything that is set forth to do. So I, I thank you, Father God, that every heart is, is ready and open to receive the fullness of everything that you have. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. So we're starting tonight in Jeremiah. We, we talked about Jeremiah last week, but uh, we're going to go deeper into Jeremiah this week. In the, in, the, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a prophet of the Lord. And the time frame of Jeremiah is he's a prophet at the time leading right up to uh, the Israel um, captivity of Babylon. So this is leading up to the time where Nebuchadnezzar comes in and, and basically sacks Jerusalem, leaves it desolate, and takes, the, takes Israel into captivity for, seven, uh, for 70 years, okay? And, and so Jeremiah is the prophet right before, leading up to this time, okay? And Israel has not done well recently in this time. He's, they're, they're not doing a good job following God. In fact, Judah um, was, was, was even worse, all right? So, so the whole nation, you know, combined nation of Israel, Israel and Judah, they are not in a good position right now. And I'm going to give you some backdrop of this in Scripture here in Jeremiah chapter 2. So what this, this is what's happening here. This is a prophetic word uh, of God that God is, is, is releasing, and he's saying, he's basically instructing Jeremiah about the condition of Israel, okay? In, in Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 2, starting in verse 11, it says, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? Notice the lowercase g. But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. That means that they have exchanged the presence of God and the glory of God for idols and things that aren't profitable. Okay? This is what he's saying. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. That doesn't sound good. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they've forsaken the source. And then they've built themselves these idols, 
but they're, they, he says they're leaky. They can't hold the actual water. They don't, there's no spirit. There's no presence in them. They, they're, they're empty vessels that can't hold anything. They've exchanged the presence of the living God for these broken things that can hold no water. Verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled, and they made his, uh, made his land waste, and his cities are burned without inhabitants. You know, the Bible talks about how the devil goes around like a roaring lion, right? And so what we see here is they're saying, basically, God is saying, you guys have enslaved yourself to the things of the world. You've enslaved yourself to these, you, you're, you're the one that, that, that embraced these idols. You know what I've done. You've seen what I've done. You, you know that, that you're near and dear to my heart, and yet you've forsaken me and enslaved yourself into these things. Okay? You, you with me? And the things of the, of the lion, meaning the, it's a picture of the, the enemy, right? All right, so this is just getting warmed up. And then in Jeremiah, again, in the same chapter, uh, verse 19, it says this, Your own wickedness will correct you, and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know, therefore, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. So, and so notice what he's saying here. We could put it this way. You're going to reap what you've sown, okay? It's, it's, I'm not punishing you. Your wickedness is going to correct. It's, it's, you know, it's all going to come full circle. Your own backsliding is going to rebuke you. And, and he, he, uh, it's, he basically then goes on. Right? So God isn't just saying this to say this and say, no, 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 this is bad things going to happen to you. This is a call to repentance. God is, is saying, hey, you know, wah, 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 pay attention. You guys have been backsliding. You've been doing wicked things. It's time to get self-correct right now. It's time to repent. And we see this in, in the next chapter, in, ver in chapter 3, verse 11. Or it says, then the Lord said to me, this is uh, saying to Jeremiah, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Well, that's a rosy thought. And go and proclaim these words, words towards the north and say, return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Verse 13, only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against your, the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. All right, so this is a call to repentance. He's, he, he's clearly saying in here, guys, get on the right track. All right, I want you to get on the right track. And, and then if you continue to read the uh, next few chapters of Jeremiah, it's basically a warning about what will happen if they don't do this, if they don't repent, okay? And it goes on for, for quite a while, very specifically outlining the things that they've done wrong and, and what's going to happen if they don't repent. Um, and, and within that, there's these, these hints, these nuggets of hope, um, because God's always got points a way out. But my point here tonight is this. Things were really bad. All right? Things were not good at all. I'm going to give you another example here. In Jeremiah 7, uh, verses, verse 8, it says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. So here's what they're doing, guys. It's not bad enough that they've forsaken God, and they're not, they're not doing uh, things that they should be doing, that they know better. They are still going to the temple of the Lord after doing these horrible, terrible things, and going to the temple and in, in, in in proclaiming that God's okay with this. God's okay with this, right? They're, 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 going, they're going into the house of the Lord and saying, no, God's cool. He's got our backs. We can go do all this, this stuff, and which, of course, um, is not, God's not too happy with, okay? So we read these things, and this is just a taste of what Jeremiah is talking about, okay? This is just a taste of it. I believe this is why, you know, they call Jeremiah the weeping prophet, 
right? Because he's, he's living in a time where, where the people he's called to prophesy to are not behaving well. And there's, I believe if he's a true prophet of the Lord, he has the heart of the Lord. And he doesn't want to see them in captivity. He doesn't want to see any of this. And he's just crying out, please, guys. And at the same time, God is saying, this is what's going to happen. And I think he kind of knows where this is heading. And he doesn't like it. All right? And yet he, he's, he's being obedient to the, word, to the Lord and releasing these words. Okay? But this is harsh. This is, this is not a good situation. And then God kind of wraps up this whole initial thing. I mean, he goes on for, for, for more chapters, but there's kind of this initial outline of what's going on. He wraps up the initial outline with uh, Jeremiah 7. Um, we're going to start at verse 28. I want you to notice this, okay? So you shall say to them, because so this is God telling Jeremiah to say to, the, to Israel, uh, and Judah, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished, and there has been cut off from their and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away. And take up a lamentation on these desolate heights, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of His wrath. Verse thirty. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built high places of Tophet. I want you to notice this. High places of Tophet, which is, the, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and it will no longer be called Tophet for the valley or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but instead the valley of slaughter. For they will bury it in Tophet in, until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Meaning, the, picture this: the corpses there, and there's no one to even to scare away the birds and the, and the animals and that sort of thing. This is what he's talking about. And then in verse 34, then I, will cause to, then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. That's pretty harsh right there, all right? And we're going to circle back to this in a minute, but, but this, is, this is what God is saying, and he's outlining this, and after this, basically, we see that Israel uh, and Judah plead for mercy. They plead to God for mercy, and God gives them a way out. He says, this is what I need you to do. He, and along with continued warnings, if you don't do it, this is what's coming, and he's basically prophesying Nebuchadnezzar's coming in, and you're going to be sold off into slavery, Okay. But basically what happens is they reject this. They want God to have mercy on them, but they want to continue to do things their own way. They're saying, God, spare us from this so that we can continue doing the thing that caused us to get into this situation in the first place. How I many you know that's not really repentance? That's not repentance at all, okay? And so they're rejecting God's terms, if you will, which is simply, you know, repentance turning away you know you when you repent you have to turn away from things that means that uh, some of the stuff that you've done before maybe needs to stop happening not maybe it does need to stop happening right and e even in the midst of all this then god st still says i will still restore israel he is not happy you can read this he is not happy at all but he still says i'm still going to restore israel now that all goes on and now a second time in Jeremiah 19, we see a very similar word to the one that we just read. In Jeremiah 19, verse 4, it says, Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they, their fathers, nor kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence, uh, they have also built high places of Baal to burn their sons with the fire of burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command nor speak, nor, nor did it come into my mind. Verse 6, Therefore, behold, the days are coming. Now, notice this. This is, this is the similar part. The Lord says that this place shall no longer be called Tophet, the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And then verse 7, 
And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give as meat to the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate and and hissing. And everyone who passes by will be astonished and hiss because of all its plagues. Not good, right? Not good. Now understand, remember, we're, we're, we're going somewhere with all of this. But, but I want you to understand the, the, what, what's really happening here, okay? Israel and Judah have defied God. They have defied God. They have denied God. They have embraced the world's ways of doing things. They have followed Baal. Now, when we see Baal in the Bible, that, that, that word Baal there is actually not a, a spirit or a god so much in and of himself. I mean, it, it is, but it, at this time, it's kind of um, the, the meaning of the word has kind of translated, and it's really more of a title. The same way we might call God Ad, Adonai, right? Or one of his many names, which, you know, is like Lord. Baal means Lord. But because of the history behind the word, it, it really has a negative connotation of the word Lord. And it means, like, if, the way we might look at it is say it's the Lord of the world. And who is the Lord of the Bible? You say is the Lord of the world, okay? So when we're talking about Baal, it means that they have followed, they have done things the world's way, okay? And what's happening here, that, that, that place that says the high places of Tophet and the, va- the valley that, they, that is renamed into the Valley of Slaughter, what happened in that place? is that is where they built this altar of this giant figure called Molech. And Molech was this, this huge, he was this huge statue of a man, this giant man with the head of a bull, which is where we get the kind of picture sometimes of, of, the, of Satan having the horns and things like that. It, it, some people believe that this was the, the um, genesis of that. Um, but anyways, uh, that's all speculation. But anyway, so it's this giant altar, this giant man with a bull's head with his arms, both arms out, like this, okay? And this is where, I mean, it was in the scriptures we just read, but we'll put it gently. There was human sacrifices of the worst possible kind were done at this altar. Not just human sacrifices, the worst possible kind imaginable. The worst thing that human beings could do to one another. And if you think back or if you have the scripture, you can go back and look and and it it pretty much tells you what I'm talking about. All right. So when he's talking about this, this high place of Tophet that, that is now become an altar to, to Molech and to this, to this depravity, it, it really is a symbolism of the highest level of depravity that Israel has entered into. That's why God is kind of in, in ending these things with this and saying, this is a, the best example that I can give of how bad things have gotten, okay? It's the worst of the worst of the worst that Israel and Judah have done. So the valley of the son of Hinnom became a place, okay, where the dead from the sacrifices were put. Remember, that. so on the top of the hill is this altar, and the valley is where the, the, the corpses were put. Now later... After this whole thing plays out, um, actually, um, well, we'll get to that, but, but later what happens is that same valley, which was once a good place, it's in Jerusalem, it's, it's there today, okay? Um, but it, it later becomes a place where they threw um, criminals, the bodies of criminals that were executed, um, thieves, things like that. They would put them in this valley. Also, dead animals were thrown in there, and they were left in there, and they, and they were burned. They, they were burned there. They weren't buried. The, the, they were burned. Okay, leaving only the bones. And then it kind of morphed to just become a garbage dump. Um, They burnt sewage, the burning flesh, garbage, and then maggots and worms would crawl crawl around in what was left of the way. I know, right? But this is on purpose, okay? It has a strong, (laughs) sickening smell, okay? It's utterly filthy and utterly disgusting. And this is biblical, All right, what I'm telling you comes from the Bible. It comes from 2 Kings 23, Isaiah 30, Matthew 10, and Mark 9, these descriptions of this place. All right, I'm not just making this up or or, um, even embellishing this. This is biblical descriptions of what this place was like. It was truly turned into a valley of slaughter. In fact, in the New Testament, the Greek word for it is, is Gehenna, 
all right, which Jesus himself used as an illustration of hell. When Jesus was talking about hell, he said, you know what? He referenced this place, Gehenna. This is what it's like, the burning corpses, the burning body, this fire, the stink, the rock, the mag, all that, all this stuff. This, this is what he's pointing to an actual place that they would all know and understand, okay? Now, I say all this to, 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 to give you the gravity of, of what God is saying here, all right? Now, leading up to this, um, bef even before this time, when you read the book of Kings, the book of Kings many times reads like this. So-and-so became king, and they did evil in sight of the Lord. So-and-so became king, and they did evil in sight of the Lord. And, and evil, 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 evil. And every once in a while, you get a good one. There's one that did both, but most is evil, 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 with a few goods sprinkled in there. Well, one of those good ones was King Josiah. He was one of those few good ones. And, and the, he's, he's right before this. He's the generation before this, right? And, and he's the one that said, it, the Bible actually says he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his father, David. But David wasn't his actual father. He was many, many generations removed from David. What had happened is he went and he looked and he saw the old writings and, 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 and read about David and said, that's the guy I want to be like. It's a picture of spiritual fa fatherhood, really. He said, that's, despite my, my dad being an evil king, I want to do good. And so he, he read everything that he could, and he, he realized that Israel was and, and Judah weren't doing well. And so he, he tore down these altars. He tore down, the, the Bible actually says that he defiled the altar of Molech. Awesome, good, right? He defiled the altar. Um, but it's a generation, it's literally a generation later that we just read about. So Josiah does well. He does what he can, but the hearts of the people never really truly turned. Okay? You with me? The hearts of the people never really tr turned because as soon as he was gone, they went right back to the old stuff. So, so they even have less of an excuse now because they were given this chance and they really pretty much rejected it. All right? Again, we are going somewhere with this. So I want you to notice, now we just read two words from the prophet um, Jeremiah two similar words that were about this valley of slaughter, right? And which we vividly described, okay? And these were all released at a time right before what we, we know is the, is the captive, Babylonian captivity, that 70 years, okay? Now we're going to fast forward a little bit into Babylonian captivity. During Babylonian captivity is, is during that time, Ezekiel was a prophet of the Lord during that time. And in Ezekiel 37, a scripture that we are very familiar with here in this house, that we just sang several songs about, okay? Ezekiel 37 is the story of the valley of the dry bones. And we're going to look at this, verses 1 to 3. Check this out. So the hand of the Lord came upon me, this is Ezekiel, and brought me out, of the, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there was very many in, in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Now, I want you to picture this. This is clearly a symbolic thing that Ezekiel is experiencing. He is, God is not bringing him to an actual place. Right? It's in the spirit. He's, if you've ever had a prophetic word and God's shown you something, it's, it's, it's that kind of picture. In the spirit, he's showing me this. All right? So it's not an actual place, but it had to very, very likely invoke images of the valley of slaughter. Didn't it? These people, this is what got them in this place. God prophesied this twice through, through Jeremiah. This was like the exclamation point of, of what you did wrong, and, and they knew it. All right, and, and, and uh, Josiah had already tried to, to get rid of it, okay? And so when you get a vision, and, and that's your history, and you're a prophet of the Lord, and God brings you to a vision of a valley of dry bones, what do you connect, how are you connecting the dots? You with me? Okay? So think about this. God brings Ezekiel to a place that symbolizes hell, the, the, the Baal, the, the spirit of Baal, the, the title of Baal, the, um, the uh, Lord of the world, the worst of the worst that the world has to offer. A steaming pile of gar burnt garbage and flesh. All right? He brings Ezekiel to this and says, hey, can these dry bones live? Is it any wonder, really, that, Jerem uh, that Ezekiel answers the way he does? Uh, um, 
I bet you know God. All right, that's a smart answer right there, really, if you think about it. But, I mean, think of the context. He's looking at this. He knows. He, this, is the, this is a picture of the pit of hell. Can, can these bones live? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm deferring to you on this one, God. All right? <laughs> oh, oh, Lord God, you know. But just as God prophesied in the valley of slaughter years before, he, he again tells Ezekiel to prophesy two times. To the worst of the worst of the worst, to the leftovers of that burning garbage pile, that dumpster fire, right? He says, to that thing, I want you to prophesy life and breath. This is, this is the backdrop of this. You know, this should give us all hope. <laughs> this should give you hope. All right, and that's why I, I, I outlined it the way I did. This should give you hope, because no matter how bad the situation is, no, how, it could be straight from the pit of hell. This might be where we get that phrase, the pit of hell. Okay, It might be straight from that, your situation, what you've come from, what you're going through, whatever. Or maybe it's your prodigal, the one that you love, the one that's on the street is going through this. Right? That's the place that they're in. That's the situation that they've got themselves in. It may be that, that you or we or they or whoever de denied God. They defiled God. They did these, these horrible things. We did it our own way. We followed the world's way. We completely ran after the, and made, made the things of the world, whether it be finances, whether it be stuff, whether it be drugs, whether it be... We made that our God. And we reaped what we sown. It, and it led, and maybe, maybe it, it led to just a horrible, horrible dumpster fire of a situation in your life. All right? Some of you are laughing because you're like, you're not saying amen, you're saying oh me. <laughs> Again, or it could be somebody that you love. It could be one of your prodigals. It could be somebody that you're trying to minister to in your workplace that comes, that, that comes into your store. Whatever the case, might, this might be where they're at. But it should give you hope. Because what he's saying here is in the worst of the worst of the worst possible situations, the word of the Lord can come forth. Amen. It can come forth and speak to the most horrible situations. And, and, and it can speak life. And it can speak breath. It can bring life to the body. And it can bring breath to the lungs. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this. Why twice? Why did Jeremiah prophesy it twice and then why in the valley of dry bones did, did Ezekiel did God tell Ezekiel to prophesy it twice I believe it's this I mean you can you can get a lot of meaning out of that um, in a lot of different ways but I think the, the word of the Lord for this is is that it's the body and the breath it's the body and the breath and what I mean is that I believe that God's word can come in, in, in when we're in that situation and it can begin to shift things in the natural it's the picture of the body coming together. Again, in, in Ezekiel 37, what happens is the first time he prophesies, he prophesies life to the body, and, and, and it says that the sinews, uh, the, the tendons and ligaments, things like that begin to connect, and the flesh comes on, and basically flesh, blood, and now they become from dry bones into a living body. But they still need the breath at that point, okay? And it's, but what happens is, is God's Word can come and shift things where it's dead and dry and gone and buried and just desolate, and it can, it can bring life in, into a natural situation, right? No matter how bad it is. It's a picture of Romans 8.28. Now all things work together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose, right? So again, it could be drugs, alcohol, finances, family, whatever it is that is just a complete dumpster fire situation in your life. It could, it's so bad. But as God begins to work in that situation... So many people here I know can testify, all right? I know you guys can testify. Things begin to look different. I, 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 I know, I can, Danny, you're, you're, you're throwing me off because you're not in your spot. <laughs> but but I, I, know I, I, I know I can use Danny as an example here because I've literally seen him, while I'm preaching, run out those doors to tell his testimony to somebody outside, okay? So if he's willing to... to I'd, I'm out of here. I just want to tell you what Jesus did in my life, right? 
I think it's okay to share a little bit, right? But, but Dan, Danny can testify to these things, having been in that place, having been addicted, having been, been to the lowest possible point, right? And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along, and you feel like you've just made a mess of your life. You've, you've done everything possible wrong that you could do wrong. You've done it, and worse. How could God ever redeem this? And yet somehow something happens. I know because I've been there too. Maybe not in the same level as uh, some people, but I've been there. Where you're like, how could God possibly ever use this? But something begins to happen and things begin to connect. And things begin to come together. And, 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 and even though it doesn't undo any of the bad stuff that you did, suddenly you can see a light. Suddenly you can see how maybe God can use these things. Maybe God, God can turn these things. And here's the thing. I, if you've ever been in that place where you're the lowest of the, in, in the lowest low, you just feel like like you're, you're in that pit, right? You, you're not like, God, just restore me into some great grand ministry of, and, and I'm going to reach. You're just like, God, I'd just be grateful to just, just have a job again, to be able to drive again, amen? You know, and yet you know, right? I know, Danny knows. I know that many of you know that God's, God, you might be satisfied with that, but God's not. God's not. He said, oh, you watch. You watch what I do to these dry bones. You're, you're thinking, I just want a tiny smidgen of, of, of a normal life again. And God said, I'm going to elevate you, and I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to bring things back together in a way you can't even possibly imagine. And you begin to see these things connecting, and you're like, oh, God, you're so good. Yeah. Right? You, maybe you've been there, and you, you understand that feeling. But here's the thing. If you've been in that place... You know that, again, the bad things don't go away, and you begin to, to rebuild, if you will. But there comes a point where it becomes more about the situ less about the situation around you, right? I mean, all that stuff being restored is great and wonderful, and praise the Lord. But it's not so much about things being restored. It's about confronting that spirit, that Baal spirit, that worldly spirit that got you there in the first place. Confronting that, getting rid of that thing, and replacing it with the breath of God. All right, that's what's happened to this man here. Right? That's why he runs out the doors in the middle of service to, to, uh, to pray and prophesy and tell his testimony. Because it's not just that God has... has restored things and is, is restoring things and will continue to restore things. It's that there's something that has been replaced in his spirit. The breath of God, that fire that we talked about on the mouth last week, says, I need to share this. That, that it's not even so much about restoring me. I'm going to make the devil pay for what he did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm going to make him pay he may have done this in my life, but God is restoring my life, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him pay but by getting two people saved, three people saved, ten people saved. I'm going to the, I'm gonna go into the prisons, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to bring people to church. I'm going to make a counterproductive devil for you have ever come against me. Yeah, That's the breath of God. When, when it becomes like your mission in life to, to, to just to speak life, Right? It's not about the things being restored. That's great. But that's the breath being released. Instead of speaking words of addiction, you start speaking, you start ministering words of deliverance. Instead of speaking, or instead of seeking wealth, you start seeking the word. Right? You go from defying God's ways into declaring God's victory. That's what the valley of dry bones is all about. That's what the prophetic comes to do. That's what it means in that literal dumpster fire picture of hell situation. God is still God and he can still somehow I still don't I still can't figure it out in my own life. I can't I seriously guys, I can't. You know how well God can turn things together? And he can make those things come together. For you, just a tiny bit of my story, I, for, for me, it was alcohol. It was, I, I would be what many people going through the things would call in the early stages of alcoholism. I didn't get to the horrible, terrible stages, but I was there, and I was on the precipice of losing everything. In fact, if it wasn't for some amazing godly people in our lives and, and the tenacity of this woman, I would have. 
right? But in the midst of that, that all of that stuff going on, somehow in, in, in that there was, I got into karaoke. And, I, and, and you can go to the bars and you can drink and you get a little liquid courage and you can sing karaoke, right? I mean, I was scared to death at first. And then before you know it, I'm like, eh, singing and, you know, having fun. And I loved it, right? I, I, I loved it. I mean, was, I, I, I actually got equipment so that I could karaoke DJ. I have it still in my house, the equipment, all this sort of stuff. I had all the, the stuff, and, and we still had, we would do, um, even, even after all this, we would do home 80s karaoke nights. <laughs> well, Sarah was nine months pregnant with Michael. And, uh, but, so, I mean, you'd think going to the bars, getting drunk, being around that atmosphere, singing all that sort of stuff, you know, how can God, and seeing what it ended up almost causing me, how can God possibly use that? But you know what? You know what God went and did? He got me completely, going from, you guys have no idea. I was horrified of standing in front of people with a microphone, of hearing my own voice through a microphone. Even before I met Sarah in, in high school, I was immensely shy. I was starting to come out of it a little bit, but, but the microphone, the people thing, oh, right? No. And somehow in the midst of my going after the things of the world, God told me to be, taught me how to be comfortable standing in front of people, using the microphone, hearing my own voice. Oh, and guess what? He taught me, he, I, I learned how to use uh, equipment, how it all speakers, all this stuff works out together. I designed all of this when we, when we did this building from my experience running away from God. God used that, that crazy situation. He said, you know what? Hey, you, you, you learn this stuff. Guess what? I'm going to use it, right? That's what God can do. You just never know, right? All right. But Ezekiel isn't quite done yet. We, we, we know the story. He says, can you prophesy? Yeah, prophesy. And he tells him to prophesy two times. And remember, again, how it was two prophetic words from Jeremiah that really pointed to this place. They said, this is your opportunity to repent and, get, and, and prevent this from happening. They rejected it. But there's two prophetic words about a valley that Jeremiah prophesied. And now we're here in Ezekiel, and there's two prophetic words that Ezekiel is prophesying in a valley. And my question, the question that, that God had kind of placed on my heart, you know, when God places a question on your heart, he's trying to teach you something. And he said, so, so why... What was the point of the prophecy? What was the point? Where did those dry bones end up? Well, they ended up in Ezekiel 37.10, where it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and there stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. An exceedingly great army. So my question then is, what is that army for? This is an army born from a situation that said, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. But they went there. And now, in, in this symbolic picture of the Valley of Dry Bones, God is saying, you can prophesy life in the, mo in the worst of situation, and out of it can rise up an exceedingly great army. So what is that army for? Well, this is our last, last stop here tonight, and we're going to 1 Samuel 17. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, why does 1 Samuel 17 sound familiar? I will tell you why. It is the story of David and Goliath. It's the story of David and Goliath. And it starts, 1 Samuel 17, starts with two great armies standing on a hill, either side of a hill with a valley in between. Okay? And what we have here is a giant on one side. A giant Goliath challenging the armies of Israel. All right, and this is before Israel split into Israel and Judah. So he's challenging the armies of Israel. This guy's big. He's real big. He's nasty and mean. He's intimidating and strong. And the whole backdrop is the, the, of this challenge is if they, he's challenging Israel, anybody in Israel to one-on-one -on -one combat, and whoever wins that one-on-one -on -one combat, the other army will become the slaves. To the, one, the one will become slaves to the other. So here we have a giant, or by the way, remember what happened in, in Jeremiah. 
right? That they, they, they didn't do what God was warning them, and they ended up in slavery. So what was going to happen here with Goliath? If you lost to Goliath, basically Israel would end up in the same sort of situation that, that their ancestors ended up all those years later in Babylon. That's, that's the, the, the stakes here, okay? So here stands this giant defying God. In 1 Samuel 17, 10, he says this. Come on. There we go. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man and, that we may fight together. I defy. That word defy there translates to this. It means reproach, to taunt, to blaspheme, to jeopardize, to criticize, to find fault with. Just as all those years later, those, the, the idols of Baal caused Israel to defy God, and Judah to defy God, right? Here's, here's Goliath saying, here I am on the top of this mountain, just like they built that altar of, of Molech and the top, on the top of the hill with the valley in between, saying, I defy God. I defy the armies of God. I, you know, I, and, 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 he's, and that word means, it, it's, God used so much of the same language in Jeremiah when he was describing what the children of Israel and, and, and Judah were doing, that they, the, the, that they were blaspheming God. They were, ta- they were making a mockery and abominate. All is, it kind of encapsulates the same sort of thing. So here's, here's Goliath as, as a picture of that defying God, which is exactly what their ancestors did. They, they gave into it. They built that giant. They, they built that altar of Molech above the valley. But here, years earlier, the army, the army of Israel is in a, in a similar situation. And, and this is where David comes in. David sees this. And what, what, when David sees what's going on, what, was, what does he say? Oh, that guy's big and scary. I don't know. No, there was a there was a word in his heart, there was breath in his lungs, and there was fire on his mouth. It didn't matter how small he was. It didn't matter how young he was. He knew who was on his side. It didn't matter how big that guy was. It didn't matter at all. When David sees this, he sa- this is the fire that's in his mouth. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God? Notice that, that would defy the armies of the living God. What did, the, what did the prophecy in the Valley of the Dry Bones ultimately bring? <laughs> An army. And not only did David say that once, he said it twice. He repeated that, that, that declaration. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We all know how the story ended. Right? We all know how the story ended. Picks up the rocks, puts in this sling throws the sling, hits him. It actually says the rock like, like embedded in his head. Goliath falls over. And then David comes up to Goliath, takes his own sword, and cuts Goliath's head off. But let me ask you this. Where in that story was Goliath actually defeated? Was it when his head was cut off? Was it when the rock hit his head? I, I believe... It's when David determined that nothing, nothing could stop him. It was when David said that, when he prophesied that, if you will, whether he meant it as a prophetic word or not, when, when, when the breath of God was released, the fire of God was released from his mouth, and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God? That's the moment Goliath was done. It just took one. They had armies there that were, that were cowering in fear. Saul was picked to be king because he was the biggest and the strongest and, and, and trained as a warrior. Why was Saul not down there fighting? They were all afraid of Goliath. It took one little ruddy kid who dad didn't think enough of that when, when the prophet came to anoint the next king, he didn't even call him in. Hope you see that. I don't, I don't care what, how you see yourself, how you feel about yourself. You may feel like, like, like others are looking at you saying that you're, 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 you're not even worth bringing in in front of the presence of the prophet. That's not how God sees people. And here's this kid. And as soon as he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He was done. It was over. It was finished. Amen? 
So why does the breath of God come? Why does it come to the dry bones? I believe that the breath of God comes to speak to the dry bones in our life, in, 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 in our prodigal's lives, in the situations around us. The breath of life comes to the dry bones so that we can defeat the giants in our lives. Starting with the one that got you into that dumpster fire in, this, in the first place. All right. Some of you might be have been through this, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. All right. But but there, there's you may have come out of the dumpster. For, you may have gone through that. And there comes a time where you have to face down that giant. Hallelujah. But here's the thing. I I think that when you really have the breath of God in your lungs, that fire in your mouth, when you really when you get a taste of what it's like to defeat a giant. There's a reason that David picked up five stones and not, and not just one stone. It wasn't because he was afraid he was going to miss it. because there was four other giants that were known to exist in the land, the brothers of, uh, of, of, of Goliath. All right? that, that, many people believe that, at least, that, that he picked up those things because, you know what? If I see one giant, there might be four others around here, and they're going to suffer the same fate. <laughs> see? There's something that happens. There's something that happens. That, that, that rises up in you, that, it, that you, you begin to get a taste for giants. Bring it on. Bring it on. I can't wait to see what God does. I can't wait. You know what? We need some giant slayers right now. We need some giant slayers in the kingdom of God. And, and, and you know, what, what we have is a bunch of people languishing in the, oh, the valley's so dry. Oh, there's dirty bones all around it. Oh, everything's so terrible. Prophesy life. Stand up. Get your army together and begin to slay some giants. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Now, when David faced Goliath, when he, when he faced that giant, everyone else was afraid. Everyone else, they were there, but they were afraid to step out and do it. But when he faced that giant, he wasn't the only one that benefited. Everybody else did. Sometimes it just takes one. Sometimes it just takes a remnant. And you see what I'm saying? That, 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 that we can come together. We're, we're, we're a small enough church, a small enough company right now. We can say, well, what can we possibly do? Well, you know what? We can possibly stand up in the mindset, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the anointing of David and say it doesn't matter how big that this thing that the world has thrown at us is. It doesn't matter if everyone else is cowering in fear i am going to stand up and say is who is this uncircumcised that means who is this person who is out of covenant who, who are they to tell me what to think what to believe who are they to dictate when my god is so much bigger Amen. hallelujah and here here's the, the other good news you know what whether you're in a place of the valley of dry bones and you need to be prophesied life or not you know david didn't have to get to the valley in order to see victory over the giants I would much rather be standing in a place uh, just declaring God's word and seeing the giants fall than having to give in to the giants, having to bow to those things and then come full circle along. And either way, it gets defeated, right? Understand, either way, it gets defeated. But my heart and what we're going to do going forward for the next few weeks is we're going to look at how to defeat the giants, all right? We're going to look at how to defeat the giants, all right? And I don't know what that's going to look like. <laughs> but if you've been in that place of the Valley of Dry Bones, and then I'm prophesying life. This is a word of life to that situation right now. And if you've come through that place, then, then I'm here to tell you that you came through that place. God did that work in your life so that you could be a giant slayer. Amen? Amen? Amen. You guys stand to your feet. We're going to pray, and I, I feel bad for the people online, but um, this is what I want to do here tonight. Um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to pray quick, and if you need to go and be released, you can go and be released, but um, we're going to end the live stream, and if you, if you want to stay, I want to actually continue to minister a little bit, okay, because um, there's more I have to say about this. And we're just going to let kind of God flow and do what he wants to do. Um, but if you need to go, then that's fine. And the kids are down watching a movie, and I don't even know where they're at. So, so maybe we got plenty of time. But uh, um, 
So we'll, we'll, I'm going to pray. Or we'll do the, the quick end, end the video, and then, sorry, guys online. Um, but, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue. I'm going to continue to, to preach and minister just a little bit further because I think there's more that, that, that I want to release, but um, I just don't want to be restricted and feel like, eh, should I say that right or no? All right. Now I've already said too much. So I, <laughs> I don't want to get myself in trouble. All right. Father God, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Father God, for each and every one that is gathered here, each and every one that is watching in line, watching later, whatever it is, Father God. I thank you for them. I thank you, Father God, that you are near and dear to them. I thank you, Father God, wherever we're at, even, even, even in the midst of that, Jeremiah 29, 11, in, in the midst of that situation that, that you said that, that you had plans and purposes for them, to prosper, to give them a hope in the future, to prosper them. Even though, even through everything that they had done, you still had a good plan and a good purpose. And I thank you, Father God, that you have a good plan and good purpose for us as well. That you're not a respecter of the person. So wherever we're at, whatever we're going through, I thank you, Father God, that, that your prophetic word comes to bring life, bring life and bring breath in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father God, for our prodigals and the people that are near and dear to our hearts that might be in that dumpster fire situation. And we prophesy life and breath to those situations as well. And Lord, I thank you, Father God, that we rise up and, 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 and you don't just do your work in us just so that we can just be but you do it so that we can be a great and exceeding uh, exceedingly great army and that we can be giant slayers <laughs> and so i thank you father god that as we go here tonight that your word goes with us that your all-consuming fire goes with us lord i pray that you give us an opportunity in this coming week to be a light to be an example uh, to just be a blessing to somebody uh, in the world around us in jesus mighty name and everybody said amen amen, amen.